This is the official sector trends uh, this Monday. Let's begin like this. Let's talk about what has been one of the most affected uh, industries in the country because of the coronavirus pandemic, the insurance industry. And there are a lot of uh, ways to look at what has been the effect of the coronavirus pandemic on uh, this specific industry. But that's fine. We're going to hold on because that's the only conversation that we have for you this morning. And so we'll do justice for you this morning to get in touch. 20146, your SMS line at Metropole TVKE across all your social media platforms. At Kianga Simba is my underscore on Twitter. Let's get uh, speaking here. It's a Monday. Good. All right. Let's introduce the panel that we have for you this morning. We're going to paint a picture of exactly where we are headed in terms of the insurance industry in the country. This morning, we are joined by Adelaide Odiambo. She is the CEO of Blue Wave. Adelaide, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Fantastic. Happy to have you around. Let's cross over to our next uh, guest this morning. We're joined by Washington Dagam, who's the chairman of BIMA Intermediaries Association of Kenya, Washington. Good morning, sir. Hey, man. It's a good year. Uh, should I say Happy New Year? I mean, this is the first time we were speaking together this year. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's cross over to Geoffrey Kip Tim, who's the CEO of Insurance. Sorry, we're, we're just going to wait on that and go to Anthony Mwangi, who's the Vice Chair, as is the Shop of Insurance Brokers of Kenya. Anthony, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing well, and you? Thank you. Oh, we're good as well this morning. Let's cross over to Gabriel Mwendwa, who's the investment associate, Horizon Africa Capital. How are you doing, Gabriel? Yeah, I'm good, Simba. How are you doing? All is good. Let me cross over again to the last panelist that we have for you this morning as well. And we will be introducing him as a Davis Ongibo, who's the general manager, Octagon Insurance Brokers Limited. Davis, how are you doing, sir? Davis, can, can you kindly mute your mic, sir? Good morning. Sorry, sorry. Good morning and uh, good morning to everyone on the panel. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Happy to have you around and officially introduce you to Metropole Television, Davis. Good. So that is the panel that we have for you this morning. A lot of issues to go through and let's start with what has been the key insurance performance indicators of 2020. And that's exactly what we have for you this morning on your screen in terms of that data. And the question this morning, this is exactly what we're going to answer pretty much across the panel that we have for you this morning, is how has the insurance industry fared within the COVID-19 pandemic? Adelaide, let me begin with you on that quick sentiment before we delve further into it. Quick sentiments are, it's been a very difficult year for the sector. Um, I think we have seen a huge decline across uh, the different uh, classes. Um, as, as, as you're presenting in the data, it's been, um, the sector, as you all know, has suffered gravely over the years, even before the pandemic uh, created a, a, a shock trigger. But what has really been perhaps an upside to this is the push to digital channels, the push to digitalization and just disrupting the space. So COVID has come as a blessing in disguise. You have seen almost all insurance companies, the board discussions are how do we push all our processes? How do we push all our sales? How do we increase penetration? Uh, to the contact, direct contact, contact trace, and the models we were using before, traditionally the agents face-to-face -face have, been, um, have been disrupted, thankfully, actually. So um, a, a huge 40% uh, of all insurance companies have already actively uh, put in uh, measures to push, um, to, to push um, this business on the digital front. So the grave de decline in, 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 in data, and I know Anthony is our, is our data guy, will share that with us um, um, more intrinsically, but the decline in uptake has been a clear show that 
the, the pandemic has uh, affected us. And in as much as uh, penetration was declining, it's it's certainly going to um, be a lot worse. Pretty much. All right, Washington, let me introduce you into the conversation. For you, how would you summarize the insurance industry performance in a 2020 as we get into 2021? Well, thank, thanks, but good morning. And, um, well, we all know that um, the insurance sector has been hard hit as far as uh, uh, the volumes and as far as uh, what we call uh, transactions as is concerned because it's, what you find is that uh, most people they've been forced to scale down on their insurance coverage yes most people have been forced also to cut down for example on uh, what they think insurance is not actually uh, important for example like in health like medical insurance most people have done away with it that's what i've seen mm -hmm. actually mo most of my most of my clients for example you find that they've been they've been uh, forced to take, uh, order, for example, if, when you have like the option of benefits, like uh, med, uh, like optical, like uh, uh, things like dental, you find that most of them they're scaling down on that. So they just want to just they just want to have the basic cover. That shows you the kind of uh, environment that insurance uh, industry is uh, operating in. It's been down. I mean, that, that, that's, that's, that's a long and short of it. It's been quite down. It's been quite down. Davis, let me bring you into the conversation as well. Could you give us, if you may, an, I, I would say a, a regional perspective of how the industry has performed uh, within the coronavirus pandemic, and especially in 2020? Um, uh, I think in my honest opinion is uh, we, yeah, we have faced a lot of challenges for it, especially coming from 2020. Yes. But um, but um, I think I think I saw an opportunity, and uh, it's a wake up call, especially to us the players in the industry to come up with probably more innovative products, because you see at the same time uh, it's the same time now. Initially, you will imagine uh, COVID was not covered or pandemics were not covered. Now, especially for medical. Uh, insurance but now you see that has been covered to me it comes with so many opportunities i think going forward covid has shaped the way we we are going to structure products the way we are going to do premium pricing all that so for me it's coming with a very great opportunity and there is also a challenge to all the players insure especially the underwriters to see that even as we come up with products, even as we are pricing products, even as we are innovating, we are innovating uh, the products in mind that are, the times are always changing very fast here. Pretty much. All right, Anthony, let me bring you in on this conversation this morning. What is your summary? Is it similar to your previous panelists' sentiments? Uh, pretty much. Um, I think we're operating on the same uh, page with them in terms of uh, how the insurance has fared. The yes. group that actually our penetration um, figures actually they are showing that we are down, you know, for the very first time in a very very big percentage. So yes. I think to a great extent, uh, to a great extent, I agree wholly with the sentiments my uh, co-panelists have actually articulated. Uh, we we it's actually operating in a very difficult uh, environment. Um, but I'm sure as we continue going, we are going to discuss perhaps some of the ways to really come up with the solutions to that. And right. I think some of them have been alluded, particularly on the issue of the digital uh, platforms. All right, finally, on the general outlook, we do bring in Gabriela Mwendoa. Gabriel, do you share the same sentiment? And where do you see this performance really heading in a 2021? Uh, thank you, Simba. Uh... Yes, I believe it's been uh, a year of reflection for players in the insurance industry. Uh, I think uh, we've seen the buffers they had built uh, be proven to not be sufficient in terms of uh, supporting their performance in such a tough year. And so a lot of rethinking needs to be done uh, going forward. Uh, and I think we'll dive uh, into that in the discussion. But yeah, a lot of rethinking and reflection in the year pretty much all right let me begin with you there for adelaide this morning now we do know that while we have to adapt 
to what has been the effects of the coronavirus pandemic, which has shifted the way in which we are doing business. So from a CEO perspective, how is the industry adapting to a hybrid work model? And are we at any time going to be remote ready, just in case, based on adaptation to the changing economic times? <clears throat> Um, I, I, in my in my opinion, the adaptation is very slow. Yes. Um, you would expect that um, you'd expect that every single um, business line, every single um, every single company would already make it uh, outmost a mandatory uh, that uh, every single process is is digitalized. We do applaud um, Aki's move for the the, the e sticker, but mm -hmm. we find that still. Require we still require that uh, motorists go to a cyber or something to get this printed. We should have the complete 360 where the police can be able to just key in your vehicle details through SMS or through USSD and they can be able to access your validity of your sticker. And, and we do away with the redundancies of printing. So on the motor side, it's applauded that um, the 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 pandemic forced the quick uh, national uh, rollout of the of the East ticker, which has been really really helpful. But if you look at the adaptation across the other avenues, because insurance has the enrollment phase, it has the 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 the, the, the underwriting phase, it has the the, the customer customer onboarding and claims process phase. If we are looking at those elements. We are still seeing insurance companies struggling with the transition. We are still seeing them having their old um, legacy systems. And you would anticipate that as a mandatory push, every single insurance company is changing to the, to the, to, to the web and changing to the cloud-based systems to ensure that there's ease in onboarding and enrollment. So um, I, in my opinion, um, the, the, the pandemic has forced us to have this conversation, which is way overdue. But unfortunately, the adaptation is still very slow. We also know that um, insurance is a lot of a trust issue. Yes. And um, there's a major trust gap. There's a major, major trust gap in, in insurance. And, and, and the fact that the, 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 the on the ground agents have always been a very intricate player in, 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 build, in, bridging, in bridging that gap. So when this nature has already been disrupted and the agents themselves are not adapting quickly enough to technology then the gap is widened even further and and and, and because of the the natural economic downfall of most people redundancies retrenchments etc insurance is highly deprioritized out of their wallets so you're finding that even with the pandemic the disruption it's just pushing the industry if we don't work against uh, ourselves work against our niche to ensure that you can leverage on the pandemic to actually push the, this industry forward. Yes. Davis, bring you in your thoughts on that as well. You spoke about the opportunities. Where do the opportunities lie within the COVID-19 pandemic as we chant the way forward in a 2021? So, um, the, the, there are actually of my thought it's, it's always in um in my very deep thought that um every single day every day as it comes every morning there always there's always something that uh, we can always do yes to provide a solution to the things that are affecting us so i think uh we can come up now with products that make a lot of sense we uh i, I always don't say don't think maybe the last expense products make a lot of sense much as uh the community doesn't like them, especially when it relates to death. But uh, talk about um, improving on the existing products, not necessarily having to come with very good products, but uh, improving on the existing products. If it is medical insurance, making sure that uh, it has enough, uh, it doesn't have as many as exclusions as possible probably with uh, proper pricing and i've seen now the regulator is trying to come up with uh, a way to have proper pricing uh, to reflect the current changes in the environment yes. the pricing system, the insurance sector and all that so 
there are so many opportunities. Much as we will think of new products, I still think there is a lot of opportunity in improving the current products. Because out of the current products, we haven't made as much penetration as we think. So probably introducing very new products might not be the solution unless the new products that we are introducing are aiming to solve a problem uh, which, 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 um, which, we, which must be very specific uh, solution to very specific problems. But as it is, we can improve on the current products and still make a kill out of it. Pretty much. All right, let's move on to the next issue this morning as pertains to this industry where the insurance regulatory authority, IRA, is seeking to review the current premium rates, signaling a fresh push to increase the cost of underwriting in an industry facing price undercutting and breach in capital levels. According to a report by Business Daily, IRA has opened the search for a consultant to recommend changes to the current methods used in calculating premiums paid by customers in general insurance that covers motor vehicle, personal accident, fire and health. The selected consultant will be required to provide guidance on appropriate flexi premium rating and abandoning for various classes of general insurance business. Now the review comes on the backdrop of regulators' revelation in October last year that 20 insurance companies representing 35% of the 56 licensed businesses were facing capital shortfalls. Now the new rates will be determined for selected classes of insurance as the IRA to strike a balance between affordability of the covers and stability of underwriting companies. Anthony, let me bring you in on this as well. Last year, you and Washington were really talking about this, I would say, in, a, in bitter terms. And I'll ask you this here as well again. Are insurance companies underpricing insurance? And if so, why, Anthony? Good. Thank you. Um, I think that's a very good question this morning. Um, what I first of all say is that it is the pricing we have currently is not on account of lack of um, proper pricing as we speak today. Yes. They are still, they are still very good pricing mechanisms that are still in place. But I think the issue of um, uh, computation has actually brought the whole issue of underpricing because people are only looking at the cake that is on the table currently. They are not thinking of perhaps that what we, what we can actually perhaps, uh, what Davis was talking about in terms of coming up with new products for our industry. So people yes. are looking at what currently is available and they share that because it is very, very retro. Uh, and then of course, as a result of that, they, you know, they, of course the curve of demand and supply I should companies try now to fight over pricing, which is, which I think it's a little bit un, uh, unfortunate, um, because I think to me the, we should actually be competing on the issues of service and even the content in the policy. But when now we look at some of the policies that we have are so similar. I mean, a motor policy, a third party policy doesn't really have anything, and therefore when you are all you know, looking at the same policy and same, it's very likely then you are going on the only thing that you can compete on, on price. And I think that's quite unfortunate. So yes, yes they are the, they are the pricing are because of competition, not because of lack of mechanisms to come up with proper uh, rating structures. I think the rating structures are there. Um, and Ryder and everybody else, and they are doing their work, but I think the issue of underpricing. Uh, and that's why you see a lot of insurance companies also underpricing themselves almost sometimes out of business. We, we have people who are uh, pricing, for instance, motor insurance companies, I mean, uh, private, especially where tender is, tenders are involved, to take a value. Do that, you also rolled up too many benefits. Yet. Uh, I'm not too sure uh, whether what the commissioner is doing, perhaps time will tell, is the right. You perhaps come up with a rating structure on a fire or a personal accident and you rode the premium so high. Yes. People, there is a little bit of underpricing, uh, which has been, you know, consequent upon the issue of uh, competition.
Pretty much. All right, Washington, let me bring you in on this as well. Is this the best move from the regulator? And what effect are we bound to see when, well, they come in and say, well, you got to price it on the following, um, the best line has got to drive towards this direction. Yes, Washington, could you kindly unmute your mic, sir? I'm getting carried away. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this. Let's do this then. We are good now? Yeah, we're good. <laughs> there's, a time the there's a time the regulator had, had tried fixing price. Yes. Uh, fixing premiums of uh, car insurance. Yes. yes. Way back in 2017 if you can remember, and uh, the court stopped that. The regulator was told he doesn't have the powers to do that. The, the ombudsman, the office of the ombudsman uh, accused IRA of fixing prices, and IRA was actually so they can't do it. So I'm wondering, is it has, what has changed that IRA is coming back to talk about fixing of prices? Because remember, there's something called actuarial science and which Adelaide uh, do. And actuarial is all about uh, fixing the premiums of uh, various products. Number two, when a, when a, a company uh, fixes its premiums, for example, compliance insurance 2.5%, I guess they know what they're doing, you know? If, they, if, 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 if it works for them, if it's about competition, let them go for it. Yes. If it doesn't work for them, then they fall. Then they, they're out of the picture, so to speak. So what is this about fixing prices? There, there's something I don't really understand. All this about fixing prices because at the end of the day, why, why is the regulator so concerned about fixing prices? This, they, they, saw, they saw the court a lot of supply and demand. You know? If in the industry, like way back in 2017, they were told, don't interfere in the sector. Remember, the competition authority, what does competition authority talk about? Commission authorities are about uh, 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 um, uh, following the laws of supply and demand, you know? If uh, you sell at a, at, at a cheaper price, for example, your products, if you can't meet the threshold, if you can't meet the margins, then at the end of the day, I think you're hurting yourself. Yes. And uh, I mean, I, I really, don't, I really got, don't get about, I really about fixing prices because at the end of the day, there's what there's what the actual scientists are doing with the insurance companies and i think that is their work i think we can leave it at that gabriel clear for us this and take us for a break before i get the sentiments of davis and adelaide on that as well i mean if you look at the stance that we're getting from the regulator that 35 percent of the 56 listed businesses were facing capital shortfalls in 2020 because of the premiums claims and if we look at that then it's 20 20 out of the 56. gabriel you like to think that probably that would be the best time for the regulator to say if you can't pay then you should look for other avenues maybe to get out of business but now he's saying but no the best way therefore is to retain them in business but then talk about adjusting prices is that the best way to go in a market that all the insurance companies are going for five percent of the share? Uh, well, the simple answer is no, Simba. It's not. Yes. Uh, and I think uh, <clears throat> when you're looking at uh, the capital, uh, you know, when you're saying these companies are undercapitalized, you're talking about a balance sheet item. Yes. Now, what I think. Uh, we may be missing is that uh, the, uh, the most successful insurance companies actually do not make most of their money uh, from the premiums. They make it from investment returns. Yes. That's what uh, we might have missed. If you look at any of these companies in any year uh, that we've had poor performance in their investment sector, uh, they have actually made losses or very low profits. And when it's the reverse, they have done actually very well. Uh, with the income they generate from premiums being almost steady. The largest increase I've seen any year is about 10-11%. The growth is not uh, really coming from premiums. So if it's matters capital, what they should be looking at is about uh, the investment portfolio because, I mean, how, are you going to, how am I going to increase my capital through premiums? Remember, from an accounting perspective, year on year, 
the premiums I collect this year do not go to my capital automatically. I have to make them as a provision to pay claims. So it will take about three, four years for premiums you collected to actually reflect into your capital. So what we should be talking about as far as the capital adequacy aspect goes is actually how they run the investment portfolio yes. uh, and how they build that. And the companies that have multiple products, insurance, uh, pension products, they're the ones who have the biggest investment pool. And those are the ones that will cut it and make it at the end of the day. So if you're just focusing on premiums uh, alone as an insurance company, you'll eventually end up, of course, with underwriting losses. And in a year like 2020, uh, you're bound to lose. Simple as that. And then in terms of fixing prices, uh, I, I mean, if I was offering something extra and now you fix the price, I have no incentive to innovate. I have no incentive to go above and beyond the bare minimum. So, I mean, if I'm going to do what my neighbor is going to do, but I have 100 employees serving my customers and he only has 20, yes. I'll end up cutting my employees because why am I offering way more service for the same you know, for the same price. I'm not allowed to price in uh, my extra service. So obviously that, and I don't think it's going to sell through. They're just trying to think around it, but it's not going to sell through. Adelaide and Davis, once we come back, what is therefore the best way for insurance companies to appropriately address the pricing model in a market that is, well, COVID-19 pandemic stricken? Once we come back from this short break, remember we're still talking about the performance of the insurance industry in 2020 as we chant the way forward in a 2021. Still one hour to go on this conversation at this morning. Get involved. Hashtag best as I am at Metropole TVKE across all your social media platforms. We'll be back shortly.